Okay, hello everyone, welcome to today's episode. Today's episode, to dive into it, is a tribute to a poem by Robert Frost. The Road Not Taken. Robert Frost, this American poet, has this has this poem I'm going to read for you. He says, Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both, and be one traveler, long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, Though as for the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. <coughs> and so, the path, uh, the road not taken, and how Robert Frost says, I took the one less traveled by, I took the path less traveled by. In this episode, I wanted to look at the existence less experienced by. <laughs> so now people understand why I was reading the poem at the beginning. Because we are creatures that exist and because this experience appears to us through the individualism of an experiencer there are two things that human beings need to pay attention to wherever they are in the world how existence is being and how experience is happening now when I say the existence uh, less experienced by you see our existence is like a constant. Now, let me tell you what I mean by that. I mean, we are alive. The human being it continues to exist, even though in the dream state or in the deep sleep state, they are not uh, in, in, a, in a sort of functional state of consciousness, let's say. I've had some dreams where I've been functional in it. I could, I could have moved. I could have even moved the world if the dream was my attention. There has been some dreams where the person can't move. It's like highly automated. It's like a coagulation, compartments of whatever you witnessed throughout the day or, you know, whatever you were anxious about or whatnot, you know. So the existence, it remains. The existence doesn't change when we sleep, but the experience changes. So human beings, it's, it's, you, we all, we can say we all exist equally, you know. I'm not talking about the social dimension and class and society and all this. I'm just saying existence, existential-wise, philosophically speaking, you can't go to someone else and be like, I exist more than you. Ha <laughs> ha. So you can't, you can't do that. So, so <clears throat> what does that mean? That means existence is a quality of being. When we think, look at existence as how stuff is, really. But experience is how stuff is to us. And that, it's, it's a transformation. Uh, it, it's pretty much sensory perception, which is the existence, uh, being contained uh, through uh, a world inside a world, subjectivity. I'll get to language in a second, but just, just to point out that 
uh, our experience is, let's say it goes through three states. It goes through waking up, it goes through dream, the dream state, the conscious waking state, the dream state, and the deep sleep. This is important to keep in mind, guys, that's one dream. So, so these three states relate to your experience. So me right now, I exist, yes, but I don't exist 24 seven to myself in this way. You know, when I sleep, I stop existing to myself, it's strange. And I wake up and it's like, yo, last checkpoint. <laughs> And very few people, I feel, notice that really all of knowledge is this dance between existence and experience. The, one of the biggest questions of, of our reality has, has to do with the nature of existence and experience. Stretching from the mystery of the true value of the cosmological constant to the hard problems of consciousness, you know, whether, whether we are existentially focused or experientially focused. The thing about the experiencer, though, is that if it doesn't engage if an effort from you doesn't arise throughout the day you don't feel you exist to yourself so even though the body's existing even though i'm existing right now you know but if based on the intelligence of, of the conscious experience if the person doesn't engage with anything doesn't do anything it's as if uh there existed potential but nothing happened you know existence is the soil where experience has sprouted from, really. And so how many new modes of existence are being engaged? There was this idea that there were 12 ways of flight, 12 methods, technologies for flight, aside from just the bird's wings. You know, <clears throat> imagine like the helicopter method could have been one of them, um, you know, other methods. The hot air balloon was another method, you know. And so when the airplane when, when the Wright brothers uh, were victorious, all a lot of the other technologies got lost. And sometimes when I look at human being and I think about the subjective relationship of the human being with, the, with their uh, objective realm, It's, a, it's like we decided to choose a certain way of experiencing existence and we stopped asking questions. And that's the most terrifying thing. You know, when a civilization uh, looks for answers, it's still asking questions. But a civilization that has answers, if our civilization reaches a point where it has no questions, that's inner extinction. If we mess up in the future and we all just become a, a, a technological program, you know, that's inner extinction. That's extinction of the unknownness of the natural experience. You see, there's something that we're not machines. We're not like a, robots that have incredible calculation and precision, even though there are some kids in India who do next level mathematical calculations. But, <laughs> but we're not machines, you know. And so because we're not machines, that means our mistakes are also information we can learn from. You know, a machine makes no mistake, so it doesn't learn from the mistake. But the human being makes a mistake, and I don't know how many people in their life they've made a mistake and suddenly realized something new. I can't tell you how many times in my life if, 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 I, if I, I felt the situation was against me, was like I felt something was wasn't working out for me and then little did I realize it was working out that was just the phase to get to it <clears throat> so the existence less experienced by is the human being wondering about what other possible ways can the phenomena of experiencing reality actually shift the implication of its existence? Believe it or not, in a, in, in a scientific sense, we've already noticed this. It's called the observer effect. That what we see influences the result. The one who's conducting the experiment is an influence upon the experiment. That's what we have realized. We can't look at something without 
a, a, a mixture of something from us, you know, with it. <clears throat> to really truly, like, if, if the human being, imagine right now, we say every idea is man-made. What does that mean? That means not only the idea of God is man-made, but the idea of man is man-made, you know? And if we consider man doesn't know anything, so man made something he doesn't know. You know? That means every idea, every word you hear was in some sense an effort from the void, from, from a meaningless state, uh, sim from a simpler meaningless state, meaning arose in complex forms. I found it hilarious. Like, I was thinking, like, you know, of course you see, you know, in modern times, you see the clash of the titans uh, <clears throat> with the gods and <clears throat> poetically that means the atheist-theist debates that are going around all around the world. You know, and for me I was like, science put so much effort to detach from religion, but, en but in some sense, strangely, strangely, the idea of the Big Bang, it's like what happens to clay when you leave it, it hardens, you know? <laughs> so in the religious context, in my own personal life, I, was, I had this, this sense of like being, being raised in a religious environment that it's as if God made man from clay. And I'm like, holy shit, you know, we're made from clay. <laughs> and what happens? You know, from a secular perspective, it's as if the universe was something of some a uh, formal capacity, let's say, of some format potential, and it cooled down. It's like the clay hardened. Do you know? And I was like, what is this? Do you know? It's like, do we have religious infiltration in scientific ideology? Like, what is going on? You know? And I realized it's not that. I thought that science was saying something different, religion was saying something different. Little did I realize it's just human beings looking at the void. <laughs> How, how precious, how adorable, you know, we feel we know something when we are like, you know, so infinitesimal, when we're a pebble in the light to be, wow, man thought he knew. <laughs> <clears throat> and it's not that we don't know anything, I'm, I'm simply suggesting that ideas integrate once they are pushed towards a more generalized, simpler level. Believe it or not, language can't be owned. It's just perceived. It's just seen. Lance, language is, I would say, me personally, uh, there was a time where, of course, there were, I would think through words first and then images. I'm telling you, in my childhood, I felt I had no imagination. I had a twin brother, and he had, like, a great imagination. And, and, and I was like, what is this? Why, do I, why, why is my imagination limited to me just visualizing words? It's as if it's like I had seen the teacher write on the chalkboard, so my imagination was at a stage where I could just like visualize words. You know? <laughs> Little did I realize, man, the educational system had it all wrong. You should you should teach, you should give the image, then explain. That means the biggest problems that you see in the educational system is that the teacher gives the language, then tries to explain the image. Of course, me in this situation of the uh, podcast, I don't have a, ba a chalkboard or something. Like in the future, I'm probably going to have like a notepad or some some whiteboard or something and make videos of, uh, like that. But <clears throat> So guys, Dan in the chat section says something interesting. My attention to... Not the ch uh, chat section branch. It says, what is thought itself? <clears throat> so Dan is saying the question, what is thought itself? I think as soon as you ask that question, you're meditating. Yes, any, th any time you, your attention becomes single-pointed, you're going to notice movements of your mind. This isn't anything. You can right now as I'm speaking to you, just stare at an object. And keep staring at an object. Just try it out for yourself. Be like, all right, let me see what happens if I for 10 minutes if I stare at an object. And you will be surprised how many different mindsets come and go. And when you get to a point where you can watch your thoughts, you can witness phenomena and discriminate between the stillness and movement, you, my friend, <clears throat> you have already won the pilot's cap, you know. Soon... 
that that nothingness that you think you see will will be your greatest command. You see, people feel in the mystical tradition. I'm. I walk in a different school of thought than many yogis. The yogis were like, "Yo, world's an illusion. It's a dream. Renounce it. You know, don't get caught in this mortal coil of illusion and imprisonment and, and the suffering. You know, don't get don't get dirty. Pretty much, that's the Buddha's advice. Don't get your mind dirty, right?" And many people feel that means you got to behave in a certain way. And so we've had so many different approaches towards truth. We had some people, the Stoics pretty much, their approach was behavioral. They were like, if my attitude is right, I, it's be the right thing. Through religion, it was through abidance, following. The reason they say faith is crucial, because religion is a story. It's a layout. It's a model. It's a model upon the world. That means even if the scientist doesn't utilize, for example, the moder model of the four general forces, you know, <clears throat> gravity, gravitational force, elect uh, what is it, electromagnetism, nuclear, uh, strong and weak forces. This is my case. This is what I'm saying. I'm saying that we're alive once. We are pretty much existing like biological candles and the, the wax of the candle is our like body and the mind is like the consciousness is the candle flame. And every day we're alive, this is the show. That means if you want to know why you're alive, it's for this moment. Exactly this moment. And also the next moment after that. And also the, the one. <laughs> you see, you're not here to to put an image on your face and think truth is an achievement. The issue is that experientially we surpass dualistic frameworks, but only, uh, but we have only found a way to explain our experience through dualism and language. This is why when it comes to mysticism, religion, sure, you go get help from someone, but if you wait for your savior, but mysticism is not is, is, is a different approach to spirituality. That means mysticism, the mystic, was different than the person who was just casually spiritual on weekends here. Yeah? <laughs> and the person who, who was so extremely felt that, it's like the esoteric view, for example, they call them theosophists. So theosophists are people who are trying to contact another parallel dimension or something. They feel there's another thing behind, beyond the invisible. There's people like that. You know, I've met, I've met some people like that, um, and I've met fools too. <laughs> it was very hard to tell the difference, you know? <laughs> But the whole point is some people take it to the, to the, take the imagery extreme, they go towards esotericism. That means if you want a form, if you want the unknown to give you a shape, you go towards the esoteric, you know? If you don't want it to have shape, you want the spirituality to be a spice in, in your life, you know, you don't even need to, it, it, you go more the natural approach. But the mystic is the human being who has completed studying experientially the existence of their humanhood. What do I mean by that? That means you have studied the objective realm. You have reached a certain conclusion of how matter is you're not avoiding matter you are looking at matter and wondering what is you see the whole issue with with lang with the language and this whole theist atheist shenanigans that's going on these poor souls that are torturing themselves in these debates <laughs> <coughs> you see the thing is One day, it's going to be like as if no thought was ever here. And if the person is not content, you break. Think about it this way. If you want to climb a ladder, you don't feel confident, you get pa paralyzed in the middle of the ladder, climbing a ladder. I don't know how many people, like, I, at some point, I was afraid of heights, but as I grew older, it was like, I was like, what am I afraid of, you know? <laughs> Like, I understand the potential of the fall, but that doesn't mean the person doesn't go see. There's many things in life that are against your favor until you favor them. Until you actually go forth and see what happens. There was something I wanted to say that thoughts escapes me.
the mystic has understood unlike childhood eyes it's not that the known is sandwiched between two unknown dimensions two unknown veils and I'm saying this to every human being listening right now most for most history general wisdom has been uh, similar to Socrates he says the only true wisdom is to know that you know nothing what does that mean that means when you look back towards when you try to reverse engineer the human design you go to nothing it's too far back you can't see it's unknown when you try to infinitely engineer forward you begin to see uh, it is unknown so right now the story of human life every story that is our history his story <laughs> Whoever's story, the winner's story or whatever. <clears throat> they say history is written by winners. You know, but guess what? If the his if the winner has to change history, you're a loser from the beginning. You know? Think of in how many parallel storylines of the idea of yourself you could exist in this moment and in how many ways you have existed so far when you actually think about it humans have mastered selfhood we have mastered being <laughs> it's like you know <clears throat> it's like going to a job interview and the guys like tell me about your experience you're like okay so um you know there was a point where i was a single-celled organism you know, <laughs> at the bottom of a sea after billions of years, I made it out of there. You know, that was a huge achievement. You know, then I stood up, then I learned, created language, then I built civilization. Now I'm here asking to see if I can work for the civilization that my ancestors built. And the person in the job interview is like, hey man, we just, you know, it's like, can you serve coffee or not? That's all I'm asking. <laughs> you know, imagine it's... <laughs> There was a time it was okay for me to belittle the world and that's why it was okay for me to belittle the self. Only when I realized that the world has an honor that surpasses any, 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 any self, any selfish uh, uh, action. You see right now, I have two options. You see, when I give a talk, I notice that it's piloting the attention. Speeches, you're literally uh, drawing a painting, but the brush is the audience's attention, and the paint is your words, I feel. It. <clears throat> that means um, there's many microphones in this world, you know, but they're not all held by visible hands. Humanity, once finding an allegiance with the elemental realm, will begin to wonder about the animate potential of the elemental realm. Right now, we are saying we are a complex set of particles. You know? That means think of all the chemicals and all the um, elements in the periodic table that right now could be in your body and in your digestive system and in. In just in your whole system, you know, just think of all the different atoms that make up you. Isn't it fascinating? Now, what we notice from these atoms is that we don't feel like, a, like I don't feel like, you know, a Googleplex of atoms right now. You know, I don't feel like atoms right now. So the idea is that atoms, as they organize, to shift from the experience of their individualism. That means when individuals become collective, their experience of what they are changes. That means, ladies and gentlemen, as your civilization advances, you will advance, your children will advance, and your children will care for a world that they can't wait to wake up in. Right now, this civilization, this world we've made, 
Uh, there's so many messed up shit going on in this planet that you can't wait to sleep. There are some days that, you know, I give these talks and people are, you know, people may be like, oh, nice. You know? But I, 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 there's times where I have finished talks, these talks, and I've just, it's been like, let me tell you, there's two ways to cry. There's, you can cry for an outer phenomena, and you can cry for an inner phenomena. When you cry from the inside, your nostrils, your nose doesn't get, you know, your, your what is it? Like your sinuses don't get moist or whatever. <laughs> when you cry from the inside. So I, I can't tell you, I could really just tell you this. There's been many moments where I've had, uh, a, 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 like literally the emotion is not conscious. The emotion is unconscious, but the eyes still are accessible, so tears are running out. I've had various moments, guys, where randomly I've there's been like tears from my eyes. But it's not random. It is it is like an intensity. It is an intensity and always an underdog situation with the the, the way the psyche has fragmented to itself. You know, because let me tell you, your greatest critic Right now, if I was to say, if somebody asked me, Mr. Within, who's the greatest critic of your talks? You know? I would say the man in the mirror. The man in the mirror who knows how they are designed, knows how to also break them. You see, you can't build something. That, when Edison built the light bulb, he knew. Like, if somebody told him, take it apart, he instantly knew how, because he put it together. And in life, your moment is something where you put together and the world breaks and you put together and the world breaks and you put together and this is the symbiosis this is the dance of life life takes a bit from you you take a bit from life life takes a bit from you you take a bit from life and AI is like stop it with these bits already <laughs> I feel nothing great can happen without a uh, life force. I feel that we are not just uh, living beings. We can imbue the, we can direct the force that is being this life of ours. You can do this. It has been, people are conditioned. Let me tell you, you want to know how what, what, what's an easy way to conquer a civilization? Here, I'll create the example. Imagine, guys, usually people want to see happy, peaceful examples. I'm going to create another setting. I'm going to say, imagine, <clears throat> instead of civility, we became a warrior species. We became such a violent warrior species where our youth... We would teach him about war. War became, became our became love for us. They asked our species, what do you love the most? And we were like, war. Imagine we became war species. And then imagine we became an interstellar war species. And then we decided to conquer the universe. And it, <coughs> imagine <coughs> our planet, Earth, imagine we went and saw like, I don't know, on Jupiter... There's, there's a civilization living on the moon of Jupiter, and let's say we, who are, who are a war species, we want to invade that species, okay? And let's say that species is just like how we are now. Let's say we go on, on one of the moons of Jupiter and notice, like, there's human beings living just like us, okay? But they're not, they're a bit different, let's say, in their features, you know, human humanoid features. And so... How would, how would one planet conquer another planet? We've had it, Sun Tzu, I was reading last night, he, he was speaking about like kingdoms fighting one another in regards to how uh, the kingdoms conquer one another. So what if planets wanted to conquer one another? How would you infiltrate, let's say, how would you conquer a, a, a growing civilization? Let's ask that question. Let's say we are the bad guys. Let's think we're the, we are the, <clears throat> yeah, let's think we're the bad guys, we're the villains, we want to conquer Jupiter, you know? So first, we would look at their people, and we would look at the way their people communicate. And we, let's say the people on Jupiter communicate like us, 
and we see they're 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 communicating efficiently. So the first thing Sun Tzu even said, Sun Tzu said this in the Art of War. He said the first thing you do is you not the first thing, but one thing you can do is you make the general and the troops, the general and his troops have a dissonance between one another. So if two armies, two generals are fighting, the generals also know this as a backup strategy or a potential strategy that one strategy to conquer the other general is to make him, make his army doubt him. Do you know? <clears throat> so what would that mean? That means if we wanted to conquer that planet on Jupiter, the people on that planet, we would make their their governing power separate from, we would make the members of the civilization, uh, we would make the individual and the collective doubt each other. And then we would invade. And that's what I think is is that we can use the reverse kind of approach as an algorithm for our civilization. What do I mean? That means right now, one thing we have seen evidence of is when, when civilization and members of civilization are not in harmony. I feel we have never on this planet witnessed 8 billion human beings building an advanced civilization. We have experienced many types of people Helping build a nice world, yay. You know, you built that part, I built this part, yay. Let's hold hands. But, but human beings that surpass creed, color, class, anything. You think we're language here? We are using it. If you never moved, if you were a statue, you think statues have personalities? <laughs> it's the mind that sees the personality in the object. So when people realize their mind is like a faster intelligent movement in the moment than physical reality then you'll be like oh that's why when i look at that other object that other human creature i can also see that they have a life a psychology a worldview and all this that's your inner realms and you see people who are polite i've noticed this they are aware of the inner realms any polite person you see that person has had an experience in their life that has made them notice the value of politeness. There was this, this scholar, I think it was Ibn Sina. They asked Ibn Sina, I could be wrong, it could have been some other scholar, this Eastern scholar, Ibn Sina. They asked him, how are you so polite, man? <laughs> how are you so polite? You know? And the guy was raised, let's say, in a, in a really rude and messed up neighborhood. The guy says very easy, man. I saw all what all the rude people said, and I just didn't say that. The guy was so smart. He looked at an inefficient environment and did the opposite and became the efficient person. That means if you are right now some kid somewhere in the world in some messed up part of the world listening, that means the environment is inefficient. First thing, know there's more efficient environments. That's why you should have endless endurance. Second, if you're in an inefficient environment, you are the model builder of the moment. You're the model builder. When you wake up in the morning, it is you time. <laughs> oh, man. Guys, the chat section is so quiet, it's like walking in a Tibetan, a rare Tibetan Buddhist monastery in the mountains with bare feet, like in one of those temples, you know? It's like so quiet. <laughs> Guys, I'm going to tell you an experience I had in India, Rishikesh, you know? <laughs> uh, I was, I, so in 2016, um, the events in this life strangely I don't know I don't know I think I talked about so much yoga that eventually life like was like all right it's, it's set in the stars for you
I found a rare opportunity to go to India for two months and to live in an ashram there. Sorry guys, my my attention's going somewhere else. Um, So, um, all right, guys, let's continue. Um, anyways, when I was in India, um, I had this very interesting, hilarious experience. I remember walking in the streets of Rishikesh, uh, in the town, you know, as a tourist. Uh, and I remember I went with this selflessness with this sense of, I'm gonna, uh, it's like as if I walked in India, I remember when the, the way I went to India was that as if I had no expectations, I had no opinions. It was as if I was walking. That was the pure, I had a lot of pure walks in India. And <clears throat> anyways, <clears throat> I remember I'm following this sort of inner vibe the, my inner realms, this sort of intuitive feeling, and I suddenly get this feeling to go into this temple and sit in the corner of it and just stare at one point of the temple and just stand. Just And for like 30 minutes, I just sat there staring at the corner of the temple, you know, inside the temple. Now, check this out. So I'm in this temple, um, the temple had this, I don't know how to explain it, I go inside, it, the temple is bigger inside, it had this long kind of, not hallway, but this opening that would lead towards the ashram, and the ashram was half open, like it didn't have a wall. So the shrine and everything could be seen from the outside and the inside.
Anyways. So guys, I remember it was it was it was funny. I, I so I'm there. I get this intuitive feeling. I suddenly just feel like walking in front of this shrine and just for a second, just staring at it and just suddenly nodding. And then I get this intuitive feeling as if something is piercing my back. I turn around and I feel like something's off with my intuition. I turn around. I see there's this guy telling me to move, literally with his hand gesturing, and I realize I was blocking his way from looking at the shrine. <laughs> but really, this is the significance. Human beings have always had an inner life, and they've had an outer life. We have defined our knowledge, our education, our values based on our outer life. We are, many human beings, they go home and they stare in the mirror, or even before leaving the house, they stare in the mirror. Why is that? Because they are aware of the self. Now, what is the position of the self? The self has been an individual. Like, we can really go back in evolution and see there was a point where there was no language, there was no individuality, there was no human free will before the human form. So the human form is an opportunity that has arose. It's a rare biological opportunity. Me and you right now are the great, greatest symphony nature has managed to play so far. Now, if we came from formlessness, there's a huge probability we may as individuals return to formlessness. Now, the only difference is... Uh, cultivating the faculty of a conscious mind that means existence is has its own program but experience seems to be a program in, in which you seem to be able to write its code that's the cool thing about experience that it's a program where you write its code right now I feel as much as I am in a biological program my DNA is a sort of code where my whole manifestation is being expressed through but I am also in my inner realms thinking about reality and statements and images filling up those gaps of uh, intent to see you know someone in the uh, chat section has said the educational system is cut off <laughs> They seem to be using a French word. <laughs> okay. To be honest, the educational system is 50% of your education. 50% of your education comes from the recognition that nobody has your eyes, nobody has access to how your uh, intelligence is processing uh, the meaning of reality is form. So what does it mean? That means we are reaching a point where we have wondered about, we have broken the atom. We broke the atom. And the atom was like, holy shit, why guys? And we broke it. And we saw smaller particles and we broke it. And we saw smaller particles and we broke it. And we reached the conclusion that 99.9% .9 of the atom is empty space. Did you know? Isn't that fascinating? Empty space is being matter simultaneously. And so human beings may think they're in a simulation. And for the sake of cyberspace culture, I am telling you, most likely our species needs to go through the cyberspace uh, teaching. You know, that means think of it this way. Humanity was such an advanced student that our species had met or was, uh, met reality beyond expectations and the cosmos was like well done mankind now I will give you your next Rubik's Cube and technology was thrown in the hands of man in the vision of man man did not just build a tool he has built tools that can have built other tools and you know in my youth I had visions of an, ambitions of an inventor let me tell you something I know I asked myself what is the greatest invention that can be made? And the answer is an invention 
that makes infinite inventions, an invention that builds the ultimate invention. And that is my effort in this life, because that invention is not just objective. We need to build a self-advancing self civilization. That, that when we take our last breath, it's uh, the only thing we need to do to the world is salute it and close our eyes. That's the, that's the civilization we need to live for. And let me tell you, no one politician can get you there. No one scientist can get you there. No one religious leader can get you there. It requires the eight billion eyes of humanity. So if you're a human being who can move, who can step uh, uh, beyond the fences of your ethnocentrism like Frodo from the Shire, you know, then it becomes the bow, not for the end of a performance, for the beginning, for the greatest beginning, you see? There was something that uh, I, for a long time, I was wondering about this problem of civilizations ri rising and falling and like, what the fuck, what's the point of it? <laughs>
that night, I got one of the most incredible realizations of my lifetime. In the middle of breaking myself in my inner realms, I was cursing at myself something like, I don't know, I was saying like, I don't know, using that word or something like I was, I was cursing at myself. Then, then I noticed after a minute, the same way, the same negative thought looped. When I noticed the loop of the thought, I instantly snapped out and all the emotion and the shenanigans was gone. You know? I, I witnessed the activity of the mind, but before I thought I was the activity, so I was identifying with that energetic situation. Your inner realms is like you're in a room you can't see, and if something happens in that room, you're going to think, it, because you can't see that room, you're going to think it's all from you. Do you know? So in that situation, I noticed it was a language loop. I was tired, probably my body was, I was jet lagged, tired, and that's why there was some sort of easy, the, the, the guards of the, the defense system of, of the inner realms were weak, you know, so, so they were infiltrated, you know. You got to realize, you, it's not that in this life you should just aim for a strong physical experience. You should aim for a strong inner experience. But the strong inner experience won't occur until you look at this life as if you're on an island alone and there's no one else and it's just you here. And you look at life for just 10 minutes at least in this lifetime. In this lifetime, there's so much time here when you're alive. But I'm saying for 10 minutes, just look at life as if there is no, um, <clears throat> you are the first person here. Look at it with those eyes, as if you're the first human being getting to see all this, okay? And you, at some point, from your honest, whoever you are, from that honest vibe, you look at reality, you f meet your unknown. You see an unknown that you are certain nobody else sees. Then questions begin arising. So that means when the mystical uh, uh, vision is found, first thing that the first opponents that run to you in the battlefield are the greatest questions of your lifetime. Questions that the experiencer within is roaring at the the, the existential phenomena without that's out in in front of your eyes. Your inner realms activate when you just like a rare instrument, you know, just like some a prodigy who, who studies the instrument and finds a way of using it nobody's understood before, you have to master your own mind. And because your mind is like uh, raised, you weren't just spoon-fed by your parents, you were spoon-fed by your environment and every experience and wave of information that has made contact with your eyes, with your senses. <clears throat> There is this quote that Dylan Thomas said to his father on his deathbed. He said, rage. And Dylan Thomas said to his father, this, I believe he's a, is he American or English? I'm not sure. <clears throat> but you could see in that English culture, I think he's English. Let me double check this. Oh, sorry. He's not English. He's Welsh. So Dylan Thomas said to his father, do not go gentle into that good night. Rage. Rage against the dying of the light. And I feel that raging against the dying of the light is the, is the symphony that builds the advanced civilization. It is the final backup system to our extinction where we go all out in our effort, then if we fail, we fail. You see, that's the thing about honor. You got to know when you lose. And then your honor maintains. That means if you're fighting an opponent and there's honor involved, that means you, honor means pretty much both beings are looking at the same reality and they don't deviate.
And of course, we know what happens to the honorable warrior in a civilization that has been infiltrated by some sort of corruption. In this world, one thing every human being needs to be aware of <clears throat> is, first of all, there is no such thing as good and bad people. We are creatures that our inner realms update based on our experiences. So you, there are just pilots of attention as moments of being. And so if we treat ourselves as attention, it means where the attention goes is your responsibility. That means the criminal, its crime was where the attention went. What the intent was, that is the tragedy. Guys, there's a poem evidently by Dylan Thomas, which I, I've actually never, I didn't know it existed until now. <clears throat> it's called, um, And Death Shall Have No Dominion. Guys, I had to relocate my uh, setup. Uh, the sun was hitting the computer. <clears throat> There's a quote from Sun Tzu, guys. Whoever's listening in, whatever class, creed, color, wherever, where, whoever you are, whatever kind of human being you are, remember this quote. Thus the expert in battle moves the enemy and is not moved by him. The enemy is your past. And so if you, in your battle, in any moment in your life, are not moved by your past, but you use the past as, as, as your, as your uh, advantage, as your... Uh, for me, the past is honestly like a toolbox of conceptual design and storylines. That's really how the past is processed. I don't know how other people treat their past, but for me, it's uh, event-oriented. 
and in the event there is various ways I can remember a moment in my past and use that memory to imagine something now like it's, it's fascinating We must care to to wonder about the existence less experienced. So this poem from Dylan Thomas who was alive from nineteen fourteen to nineteen fifty three. <clears throat> this incredible Welsh poet. He says, and death shall have no dominion. And death shall have no dominion. Dead men naked they shall be one. With the man in the wind and the west moon. When their bones are picked clean and the clean bones gone, they shall have stars at elbow and foot. Though they go mad, they shall be sane. Though they sink through the sea, they shall rise again. Though lovers be lost, love shall not. And death shall have no dominion. And death shall have no dominion under the windings of the sea. They lying long shall not die windily, twisting on racks when sinews give away, give way, strapped to a wheel, yet they shall not break. Faith in their hands shall snap in two, and the unicorn evils run them through. Split all ends up, they shan't crack, and death shall have. And death shall have no dominion. No more may gulls cry at their ears, or waves break loud on the seashores, where blue a flower may a flower no more. Where blue a flower may a flower no more. Lift its head to the blows of the rain, though they be mad and dead as nails, heads of the characters hammer through daisies. breaking the sun till the sun breaks down and death shall have no dominion. Honestly, Dylan Thomas's last two sentences of his poems are epic. Break in the sun till the sun breaks down and death shall have no dominion. <clears throat> There's a line he says, he says, um, he says, uh, though they go mad, they shall be sane. That means all the human being, all psychology's analysis of insanity is just the temporary uh, condition, of the temporary human walk. Um, Of course, Einstein's approach and definition is way more sophisticated. That means, believe it or not, many people feel Einstein. Einstein had Einstein had eyes open greater than many people's. Uh, many people who have contributed to psychology. Yeah. But anyways. <clears throat> Break in the sun till the sun breaks down, and death shall have no dominion. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, guys, this you know I tried to make it rhyme. It's, it, it all comes down to being an opportunity. Nobody knows the potential. One thing that I have tested and I have tried just throughout the years to see how I can simplify it to share people is that when you study your attention, you at some point tapped into an alertness. And alertness is an instantaneity of sensory perception.
we can't hide as an eternal void forever. After some point, responsibility becomes the ultimatum. <clears throat> service is the path to the higher dimensions, but not self-service and not serving another. It is serving your moment of being, serving nature, noticing you are alive in the brain of nature. You're like a neuron in the brain of nature, a neural synapse. said existence is again like the candle I honestly feel when I look in the mirror I'm looking at the candle I'm like is this candle melting every day <laughs> is it changing every day and of course reality is defined by change because we're defining ourselves uh, at a slower speed like if we were right now beings that were moving at the speed of life, there would be no physical reality to fear, correct? Like it's fathomable. In a hypothetical way, it's fathomable. <laughs> you see, reality is possible in many ways. It just comes down to the choices of people in the inner realm. I feel every religious person, has every theist has exactly seen what the atheist has meant. And every atheist has exactly seen what the theist has meant. And it is the, the codependence on the reverse of each that keeps the engine of both running. So you, just like night and day, you require any form, phenomena of consideration with its absence. So I don't know how many people think like this, or at least acknowledge thought like this, but any idea I have ever had, I've also noticed there's an empty, emptiness underneath it. And if you're content with that emptiness, you don't freak out when life changes. But if you're, uh, as Buddha has said, like if you, these are the three jewels of Buddhism, which is an, uh, the person uh, uh, understands uh, impermanence, incompleteness, and imperfection. You can try to be as perfect as you want, but at some point the system ends. You could try to be as uh, complete as you want. You know, you see that there's other people who are more complete. There will, the future generations will be way more complete. The future generations will be made more perfect. You know, and you see, you can try to be permanent, but you're going to see you can't. You can't be comfortably permanent. That means if human beings create Im uh, some technology for immortality, it's like there's no guarantee that uh, it's going to be a smooth ride. Right. You know, that means immortality is not for the hands of man. Because it's kind of like uh, trying to move your brain uh, by not being in it. Uh, therefore it becomes like I don't know I feel immortality has a huge potential of becoming torture uh, long-term torture for the human consciousness you know this is one reason why I was against uh, consciousness infusing with machines to some degree I'm not I mean a certain more like I feel we need to have important discussions the reason is because can you imagine some person's consciousness left as a file uh, in a folder on a computer desktop can you imagine like the file you click on in, on in your computer that could be like a human being's consciousness one day like it's mind-boggling to think that you have an ability but what is consciousness that means at most it's a tra it's it would be a perfect translation of biological and linguistic patterns into I don't know the cyberspace rendition of them. I have a certain awareness to programming, but not that complex. I understand the history of programming. You know this this is this may sound strange, but um, 
a person can have a view on their moment where they are something and everything that happens in their moment can also be something or the person just after some point I don't know like I don't know how many days a person can have energy to run after life until they suddenly notice uh, ways that it's working differently Dan, I'm suggesting that's put, that's probable in the next 120 years. It's it's very probable. It's even probable that animate objects can be viewed to character. You know, we can think the cartoon Beauty and the Beast, where I saw as a child, uh, the chandelier, the candle, the clock. They were all talking and they had personalities. I wouldn't be surprised if in the future we can create such complex AI programs that it could make animate objects in view with life. Imagine in the future there's this chip you put on any object and it temporarily for 20 days gives that object an ability to be animate. Let me tell you what's happening to civilization. Terence McKenna also spoke about this, but he spoke about it as if the universe is going through this process of an acceleration of novelty and a crystallization and complex. The universe is becoming more complex in form, pretty much. You know, and the way it's becoming more complex form is because of this acceleration of novelty, as Terence McKenna perceived it to some degree as a transcendental object. At the end of time, that means we're being pulled by something beyond this dimension. I think this can be said to be some sort of, like we can see some sort of relationship. Another way of looking at a simpler layer for design. If we look at the whole system as automatical code, if we treat life as a design, we will find a potential, that's where we find uh, free will. That means, in order for a person to have free will, you need to have a world to have it in. So what does that mean? That means a human being could be a person with incredible abilities. They just have to find the world, the space where they can allow themselves that ability to happen. And anytime you try something new, the person shouldn't look for success. That means if you're thinking about success in your first try at something, it's like... 
It's like, that's hilarious. That's adorable. You know, <laughs> for me, it, it's just like the person has to play the game for themselves. That means if, if somebody wants to be a soccer player, let's say, uh, who's listening to me, you got to first play for yourself. You got to, you got to, you get the, because the, if you play for others at first, there is, you'll instantly get, uh, on, uh, have no motivation. You got to work for yourself until you notice that others can see your work similar to yourself, then you can work with others. Because we have to realize the language of emotions is the language of seeing the same world. That means, imagine you were on an alien planet, let's say a sci-fi setting. Guys, I gotta get a pen. This pen's ran out of the bank. <laughs> Guys, quick breather. I'll be back in five minutes. Uh, thanks for tuning in so far.
Okay, guys, got some coffee. This idea of perceiving existence and experience in different dimensions, various philosophers have spoken about it. It's just now, right now, we have to wonder what it means to have an outer realm and an inner realm, and both of these being like two eyes that see the same view, uh, or one mind that is that has a sort of division of the realm between space and matter, between chaos and order, between uh, the shape and uh, the world. So there's various ways, various dimensions to life. And we can say the reason man, the human being, can see different dimensions because it's, it has a geometry to it. There is a geometry to our vision right now. I think we're mainly unconscious. I think there is a geometrical language that once human beings master this geometrical language, uh, we will speak the language of nature. That means our consciousness will find its its body to be the whole earth, you know, if we master this language. And I think the aim of it is, is like for now, just to make it like a playful Rubik's Cube for the future generations, I would say it's this, let's say it's the modern legend of a hidden geometrical language that in the future we will develop. So right now, Mr. Within is prophesizing in the future there is going to be a geometrical language and uh, this language will be the true language of nature. But the strange thing is, I don't think it would be a shape. So we would be the observers of geometry. So I feel geometry is a subtle body. is a container of, of your subjective self. The inner realms and the outer realms in modern times pretty much were wondering about their digital translation. Elon Musk, um, this great man, is uh, he started a company that is doing research on the uh, the bridge between. Uh, human beings being able to keep up with AI. Let me say it in that way. He's pretty much creating the cord that will connect us to uh, uh, AI, you know. And in one of his talks, Elon Musk said, we need people to work on the interface. That means right now we are a biological computer and there is a mechanical computer, a non-biological computer, and we want to 
drag and drop the inner realms into that computer. I don't think we need to connect technology to the human brain. We need to uh, create subjective vehicles. I think cyberspace is the healthiest way for man to engage the mind of AI. Because you see, AI is, 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 is uh, at most self-aware. The advancement, super intelligent computers. If the computer is aware of itself, why, what's the point of being aware of a self? Expression. That means any creatures, like what, what happened to the Frankenstein novel? You know, the dude made Frankenstein and Frankenstein, he didn't just sleep on the bed all day. You know, the Frankenstein got up and went to town and people shouted at him. <laughs> Frankenstein's like, what the hell? What kind of world is this? You know? And then he realized the mad science was actually crazy. <laughs> In literature, we often see the clash of innocence with wrath. The savage beast and the gentle uh, touch of love. You know? To translate the inner realms, I think it would be simply just creating terminals. You see, I think the greatest win-win strategy of man being in symbiosis with an artificial intelligent, super intelligent computer and whatnot is that we become more similar to the computer. We understand more the language of the machine and the machine understands the language of us because I think AI is not going to wipe human beings. AI is not going to process and be like, oh, human beings are like have messed up, you know? AI is going to be like, holy shit, there's no other life forms other than these human beings. AI, if it really has, act, it's really self-aware and intelligent, is going to really take care of human beings because we're the only other aliens in the game. We are an alien to AI, but we're like its father, you know? And when you wonder about the evolution of the human being, you know, what do you think legend says? What do you think myth is saying? Why do you think people created the concept of a god? Because they saw something that wasn't a thing. I feel nature is alive. I feel that every human being, believe it or not, is by nature, every child by nature is shamanic. They are going with the flow of how far reality is authorized in their perception. You know, my effort with these talks is to usher in a new era of advanced communication for human beings, and I feel we have reached the edge of the era of language worship. We have thought we're thoughts for too long. It's ridiculous. We are not thoughts where it, the situation has, is reverting back to the unknown. Mr. Within is not saying there is an uh, invisible man in the sky that its beards are made of clouds. I'm saying the uh, reality, it, it, it's like before we attribute agency, we are questioning what we are. You know, it's as if before you can read any holy book, you got to know how to read first. The implication of a requirement for a certain cultural development, then any sort of, if conceived, divine intervention. So before any intervention, we want to know what's there. And in this manner, I realized we can bypass religious blasphemy and secular materialist nihilism, you know? The way is, is we pilot through it. That means, especially in language, there's always hidden angles to phenomena. Back in the day, a bunch of people see a chair. 
a light beam is sh a light is shining s strangely just on that chair chair and all these people they're like this chair is God and so they start bowing they start bowing to this empty chair after a while, the owner of the chair is coming back and he sees a, these weird people. He's like, what are, these, what are these people doing? Why are they worshiping my chair? He gets the chair. He's like, guys, I need my chair back. And then all the people, the moment he touches the chair and moves the chair and is taking the chair, all the people shout, don't touch our God. Don't take our truth. Don't do it. You know, that was reality. That was our, the only thing we knew. That chair was the only reason we were alive. Why are you doing this? That chair, you know, was the uh, was the source of everything. And the guy's like, give me back my chair, you know. <laughs> and so Mr. Within is saying, give me back the language that you thought was true, that you started worshiping. You know, so after that chair, we stopped worshiping objects. We started worshiping subjects. Then we denied gods, but we are still worshiping ourselves as subjects. So it doesn't matter if you worship a god or worship yourself. You're worshiping some sort of subjective form. You know? For me, I, I remember seeing something like it was something very strange and very odd that I noticed from the work of um, this very, very eloquent and excellent communicator, uh, Sam Harris that this man had found himself on many stages uh, shattering the the narrative and uh, you, you get I guess the ethos of the religious tradition at the end concluding the free will is not even there Do you know what that means that means uh, telling the world it's wrong then at the end saying you don't exist <laughs> let me tell you who says new stories are not allowed as far as I'm concerned exploration in the subjective realms means finding a new way of looking at something is there really such a thing as genius or was it just the first person who found a way to look at something you know, was the person, the first person who found berries and brought it to the tribe, people were like, yo, this guy's a genius. And that guy, yes, he did something genius. He did the unthinkable. To man and he went somewhere and he found the berries that the tribe hadn't found. And he came to the tribe and brought the berries and the tribes had access to berries, like an Xbox achievement. You know, berries unlocked for the hunter-gatherer tribe in primitive society. <laughs> So you see, that person was great, but once the greatness was shared, the civilization became great. Now, suddenly, the norm became the new great, and new greatness could be found. So the journey of greatness is infinite. That means, while you're on the roller coaster, you don't know how it ends. You know? At best, you can discriminate between the inner realm and the outer realm and not forget that uh, you're breathing. There's a simplicity to the breath, you know? It's like when I think about the problems in my life, so the subjective formats of it, even uh, global problems that are going on right now, you know, because it's messed up, you know? Like, you, let me tell you, uh, just like how it's messed up, animal cruelty is messed up, what if you suddenly realize there is messed up human cruelty going on on this planet and you're sleeping at night comfortably, but it's as if, it's as if, if we could hear, if we had extra auditory powers, maybe we could hear the cries of inefficiency, waiting for efficiency to come to it. You see, it's, it's building a network of a self-sustaining system that is endlessly updating itself by allowing the greatest ideas to find the same stage, the same gladiator arena for it. That means, I've, I've said this in talks, I've encouraged billionaires to go build this. <laughs> but uh, I don't know how many people, billionaires are listening. <laughs> but if you're a billionaire, let me tell you what this world needs. Especially in the next 30, coming 30 years. 
if you are smart, uh, uh, my heart has already saluted you. This is the idea. You see, we have gotten over violence. I don't see a violent future. I think that if our future is violent, that means we're stupid. You know, Isaac Asimov says violence is the last refuge of the incompetent. It doesn't mean we're stupid. It means we were incapable. We didn't have enough skill to just get to, get to the next phase. We failed. That's failure. You know, incompetence is true failure. You know, incompetence is failing in front of your own eyes. You know, not just the eyes of others. But it's interesting that with every breath, uh, the mind finds uh, a new strategy to uh, run towards a dawn. Life is a grand opportunity for a while I thought it was something that it it like it was cruel or messed up or even the idea of suffering you know what I mean you, you play with that idea for a while and then after a point you realize it's like it's general it's like the person was they thought they were suffering then they saw someone suffering worse than them and they're like okay maybe I'm not suffering that bad <laughs> So you see how subjective suffering is. And guess what? If suffering is subjective, perhaps if you want greatness, which I would say is the true resolution, for me, the word greatness is the greatest word. <laughs> it's the greatest archetype. That means, don't you want to, don't you ever wonder about what the greatest version of you would be like? Don't you as a human being ever wonder about what the greatest civilization would be like? You see, it's nature has a law that that after the creature, even the birds, they build nests. So you see human beings, many creatures, after they become conscious, they go into a phase of the creative dimension. Consciousness means you, as a creature, uh, chose an oscillated simulation. A simulation oscillating between the known and the unknown. That's really existence and experience. And, and it's in the conscious waking state, in deep sleep, who knows? You know? That means in deep sleep, it's like in that gap, who knows? The mind could be in, in the unconscious in endless ways of life. I feel deep sleep could be when the unconscious is be moving the conscious. So the only way you can be awake in deep sleep is if you are the unknown looking at the known. The unknown is, is the greatest teacher. It is, it is the edge of the language threshold and it is the, uh, uh, the most important idea that you as a human being might have cared about what you know. Like in religion, they say, know thyself. In, in, um, uh, Christ is known, known to say that. Now, many people, they... They look towards what they know. They want to know. You know, that's why the self-help industry is huge. Because people want to know, but it's it's hilarious. Because the way it works is that you got to care about what you don't know. You got to you gotta look at your own unconscious. You shouldn't fear your unconscious. You got one lifetime to see what you are. You know. Anyways, guys, the point has been made. Um, the inner realms, outer realms, various modifications. Every human being is, is like a, a denomination of the human species potential. Uh, we will find collective honor. That idea for the billionaires was the infusion of uh, a gladiator arena. Uh, um, it was an infusion with... Uh, uh, like the, I, I felt like some billionaire should build some, a coliseum twice the size of the coliseum, okay? And we should have people to uh, a table at the middle of the coliseum and listen to group debates, global debates occurring, 
on various topics, not just politics, on endless topics. And we create this coliseum where we discover, it's like right now, think of it this way, we're looking at physical sports in massive audiences. Think about it, it's going to be an intellectual sport of how human beings treated language, knowledge as geometry, therefore realize endless ways of its uh, evolution as possible. Language is very malleable. Language is, is like the element you, have, you require to uh, uh, take control of before you can control the elements. You know? A mind that is no longer a thought is a mind that is actually allowing reality to be there first. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Much blessings and all.